you are in a dark, locked room. But what really worries you is not philosophobia, but not knowing who you are. You have not lost your memory. On the contrary, you remember a lot of things. However, each memory belongs to a different person. A student preparing for exams, or a professor giving grades. Maybe a hairdresser who cuts both of their hair. You may even be a writer who imagines all of these characters and has a change of his own. The strange thing is that all these possibilities exist together. They do not cancel each other out. They all exist at the same time. Until someone opens the door and a beam of light falls in. The person at the door calls out, Steve, you've been fooling around for too long. You need to study for your exams. That's when you realize who you are. All your memories of others are instantly erased. This isn't a scary psychological experiment. It's absurd, illogical, and unlike anything we encounter in our daily lives. That's why quantum physics is so hard to understand, even for scientists. Yet it's the one that governs everything at the most fundamental level of the universe. Today, we're going to open a door to the strange world of quantum physics. Starting with the simplest concepts, it questions all our unities about reality. I will try to explain everything, from the mind-boggling experiments to the most mind-boggling ones. Let's see if you can grasp the key experiments and paradoxes of quantum physics without losing your mind. Let's start with the basics, because without them, we have no chance of understanding anything else. Our first concept was born out of a terrible disaster, the catastrophe of Mortis. No, I'm not talking about forgetting to put on sunscreen and getting burned terribly. In the early 20th century, two English scientists named Lord Rayleigh and James James turned classical physics on its head. All they wanted to do was understand how objects emit light. Their equations worked for hot objects, like stars and molten metal, but cold, black objects created a terrible paradox. According to Newtonian physics, the molecules of these objects should vibrate at every frequency and shine at every frequency. The higher the frequency, the brighter the light. That is, all objects, starting from the molar spectrum, should continuously emit almost infinite amounts of light. This was clearly nonsense. But Rayleigh and Jaynes could not figure out why. It was at this point that the German physicist Max Planck came up with a crazy idea. What if instead of emitting a continuous stream of light at all frequencies, molecules emitted light only in discrete packets at certain frequencies? At the time, the idea seemed completely absurd. Even Planck considered it a mathematical trick with no connection to reality. It was just a way of avoiding the problem of infinite radiation. It was like changing the calculations to get a predetermined result like we all did in school. But Planck's formulas caught the attention of Albert Einstein, who started to think that he might actually be right. He proposed that light was not a continuous wave, but a stream of discrete particles called quanta, which we now know as photons. This insight was incredibly useful for Einstein's explanation of the photoelectric effect. In the photoelectric effect, a metal plate produces current only when exposed to light of one color, such as mauve because only these photons have enough energy to knock electrons out of the metal. Einstein won his only Nobel Prize for his groundbreaking work on the photoelectric effect. This discovery sparked discussion among his colleagues about a whole new area of science, the strange physics of these quanta, but none of them were prepared for the level of strangeness that awaited them. 20. In the early 20th century, scientists finally discovered that atoms were made up of three main components, positively charged protons, neutral neutrons, and negatively charged electrons. However, it was impossible to see how these components were arranged under a microscope. So scientists came up with wilder theories, each one more insane than the last. Some claimed that electrons were floating in a proton pudding, while others imagined atoms as tiny cubes, building blocks. Then a market physicist, Niels Bohr, came on the scene and argued that the atom should resemble a solar system. According to him, electrons behaved like planets orbiting a nucleus made up of protons and neutrons. However, in this model, it was not gravity that kept the planets in orbit, but the electromagnetic force. Although this model is in all textbooks today, scientists in Bohr's time quickly realized that it could not be true. Namely, as the electrons moved around the positively charged protons, a strong electromagnetic field would be created, causing the electrons to lose energy and fall into the nucleus. This would mean that matter could not exist at all. Bohr tried to solve this paradox through quantum mechanics, he suggested that the energy of electrons could not fall below a certain level of less than a quantum. However, the question of why our atoms did not produce electromagnetic fields remained unanswered. This is where another German physicist with a crazy idea came in, Werner Heisenberg. He claimed that the electron did not actually revolve around the nucleus like the Earth revolves around the Sun. Instead, 
The particle created a cloud of all its possible locations. But here was the catch. If you find out exactly where the electron is, you have no idea about its momentum, which is which way it's going in the tank. If you find out its momentum, you lose its location. It sounds crazy and completely logical. But Heisenberg's uncertainty principle still underlies quantum physics today. Erwin Schrödinger, a student of Arnold Sommerfeld, used this principle to come up with the famous equation that is still used today. Yes, it looks like something out of a math class nightmare, but all you need to know is that this equation does not determine the exact location of a particle. Instead, it calculates the probability of finding it at a certain point during the measurement. To put it simply, quantum physics is like playing the lottery. You can't predict the winning number. You can just open the ticket and see the outcome from billions of possible combinations. Physicists who have proven the fundamental uncertainty of quantum systems have created a series of new paradoxes. Chief among these is the observer effect. In a normal lottery, every number is pre-printed on the ticket, and your choice doesn't change anything. But in quantum physics, the act of deciding to observe a particle forces it to choose a location. Sounds complicated? Let me explain. Bob the physicist is blindfolded and pointing a gun at you. But it's not an ordinary bullet. It's a quantum bullet, like an electron. There's a graph of possible locations of the bullet calculated using only the Schrodinger equation. The most likely location is in the barrel, and the least likely is that it has already hit you. But the moment you stop observing it, it's time for the quantum lottery. Bob hasn't even fired yet. The bullet can go anywhere. Even a wall can't save you. Because thanks to quantum tunneling, the bullet can suddenly appear on the other side of the wall as long as it is possible. So, if you are unlucky, the next time you look, you may find the bullet in your body. But the most likely place is still inside the barrel. So why try your luck? Here's a little life lesson for you. If you are threatened by a quantum bullet, don't take your eyes off it. Thanks to the observer effect, the bullet will never hit you. But what really intrigued physicists was not how to dodge quantum bullets, but what happens to a quantum system when no one is looking. Where exactly is a particle when no one is looking? Niels Bohr believed the question was meaningless. Instead of being in one specific location, the particle exists in a superposition of all its possible locations, kind of everywhere at once, until someone looks. This idea follows directly from Schrodinger's equation, but even Schrodinger hated the uncertainty it implied. He came up with a famous thought experiment to challenge Boron's view. Yes, you've probably heard of Schrodinger's cat. A cat is placed in a sealed box with a deadly device that is triggered by the decay of a radioactive atom. There is a 50% chance that the atom will decay within an hour. If it does, the device works, and you know the rest. What is the poor cat's situation during that hour? Sadhu tells him that he is either alive or dead. But since atomic decay is a quantum process, the cat must be in a superposition of both alive and dead states. Ironically, Schrodinger created this thought experiment to show how absurd quantum uncertainty is. But ironically, his fictional cat is now the best-known example of quantum mechanics. There's more. In March 2023, researchers at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology managed to put a 16-microgram sapphire crystal into a superposition of vibrational states. It was as if the crystal was vibrating in multiple ways at once. Who knows? Maybe one day we'll learn how to put humans into quantum superpositions too. Erwin Schrödinger eventually gave up physics because he couldn't stand these quantum oddities. But one result of quantum superposition nearly drove Albert Einstein crazy. It's possible to create two particles whose properties are interconnected. For example, one particle's quantum spin can be plus one, while the resistors can automatically be minus one. Together, they always balance out to zero. But here's the catch. You can't tell which particle has which spin without observing it. But once you measure the spin of a particle, no matter how far apart they are, you know the spin of the other particle instantly. This is very important. Imagine a particle traveling halfway across the country, say from California to Washington. As soon as you observe one, you know immediately the state of its entangled partner. This phenomenon is called quantum entanglement, and it absolutely terrified Einstein. What terrified him most was that if the particles were separated far enough apart, information about one could be transmitted to the other faster than the speed of light. Einstein called this spooking at a distance, and he spent years trying to prove that there was a hidden law in the universe that prevented this from happening. Spoiler alert, this is one of the few times Einstein got it wrong. But to explain why, we have to dig even deeper into quantum physics. 
It's ironic. On the one hand, Einstein rejected quantum entanglement. But on the other hand, he didn't even question the even weirder aspects of quantum mechanics. Let's rewind a bit. In the 17th century, Isaac Newton proposed something that doesn't get much attention today. The particle theory of light. According to Newton, light wasn't a wave, but rather was made up of tiny particles called particles. Sound familiar? It's basically the same idea as Planck's quanta. But in the 19th century, as we come to the beginning of the century, Thomas Young comes on stage and does the first version of the double slit experiment to disprove Newton's thesis. Pass light through a double slit barrier and you see a striped pattern on the wall behind. These dark lines are due to interference, a property that is unique to waves. When two waves overlap, they can completely destroy each other. So light is definitely a wave. But wait a minute, Albert Einstein has just proven convincingly that light is made up of quanta or photons through the photoelectric effect. And even we concluded that he had won the Nobel Prize for light. So what's going on here? The particle nature of light is demonstrated in the second version of the double slit experiment, which became possible in the 20th century. Scientists added a special detector to check which aperture the photons pass through. And surprise, there is no interference pattern. There are just two bright lines where the photons hit directly. So light is a particle, right? Oh, my innocent, pure hearted listener. The moment you turn off the detector, light starts behaving like a wave again. It's all because of the observer effect. The act of observing changes the result. But the strangest thing is not that light is both a wave and a particle at the same time. In a third version of this experiment, scientists passed individual particles through the slits without observing them. And even then, over time, the familiar pattern of the entrance appeared on the wall behind the deep. It is as if each particle knew that it was part of a wave without any interference and that it must come down together from the top. In terms of quantum physics, even when you fire a single particle, it is the wave that passes through the slits and causes interference. But just before it reaches the wall, the wave turns into a particle, and then the pattern of lines lands on one. By placing the detector in front of its slits, you force the wave to collapse into a particle even before the interference occurs. That's why you see only two lines on the wall from the individual particles. If you followed this far, you might now be asking, how exactly does the act of observing cause the wave to collapse? Physicists have tried to answer this question with new experiments. They added a special crystal to the same double slit experiment. When a photon enters the crystal, it produces a pair of quantum entangled photons. So now we have four photons, but only one of each pair hits the wall. Since all of these photons are part of a single wave, they still create an interference pattern. But what if we put detectors not on the photons hitting the wall, but just the quantum entangled particles flying off to the side? As you may recall, when we measure one particle, we know everything about the other one instantly. That's why the interference pattern disappears, leaving just two lines on the wall corresponding to the individual particles. Again, we didn't even observe these photons directly, just their quantum entangled partners. Still, that was enough to collapse the wave. But guess what? It turns out that the spooky effect can also work in time. If you delay the detectors, the second pair of photons will hit them long after the first pair has reached the wall. So you have recreated the simplest version of the delayed choice experiment. So what do you think will happen? It seems that the details of the input should appear on the wall, because at that moment the second pair of photons have not yet reached the directors, and the wave has not had a chance to collapse, but that is not what is happening. Somehow, the later observation in the directors is a result of the earlier quantum entanglement. It affects the behavior of the photons, creating two simple lines on the wall. So either the first pair of photons knew the future in advance, or the second pair sent information back into the past. If you ask a quantum physicist what's going on here, they'll tell you that you're just imagining the photons actually flying somewhere. It's all just a single wave interacting with itself. But we started with the creation of literally quantum entangled photons, not waves. The truth is there's still no coherent explanation for these results. What we do know for sure is that quantum physics is really weird. If you're starting to doubt the existence of reality, welcome to the cosmos. You're officially a quantum physicist. Are you ready for the most mind-blowing experiments? It all stemmed from a famous debate between Niels Bohr and Albert Einstein. Bohr believed that particles randomly choose their properties after observation. Einstein was certain that these properties were determined from the very beginning. If these hidden parameters really exist, the universe must have a clearly defined reality, even on the smallest scales. But if not, chaos, quantum paradoxes, and a whole thousand hoopla. But in 1964, Irish physicist John Stuart Bell found a way to call the universe's bluff. He developed an ingenious theorem. Two scientists, Alice and Bob, 
randomly change the sensitivity of their directors without communicating. As a result, sometimes they detect quantum entangled particles, sometimes they don't. Using the simplest probability formulas, Bell calculated that if Einstein was right and the particles had hidden parameters from the beginning, Alice and Bob would get the same results at most 75% of the time. But if Niels Bohr is right and the universe does not determine the properties of particles until they are observed, Alice and Bob's results in repeated experiments will more often match 85% to 10%. For a long time, Bell thought his inequalities were too complicated for experimental verification. But in 1972, American physicist John Clauser built a similar setup using the polarization measurement of entangled photons. In simpler terms, this is the orientation of waves in space, indicated by arrows. During the experiment, Alice and Bob rotated their detectors without saying a word. Thus, the photons with the appropriate polarization were detected either on both detector sides or not at all. In other cases, only one detector was triggered due to changes in settings. Therefore, the results of Alice and Bob were different, and the final result shocked John Clauser. The number of coincidences even exceeded 85%. So Boleyn's calculations were confirmed with a margin of uncertainty. According to the theory, the universe did not really have a clear local reality at the level of individual particles. However, Einstein's supporters believed that the hidden parameters were not in the particles themselves. They objected that it might depend on how Alice and Bob rotated their directors. It took French scientist Alain Aspect 10 years to reproduce the mirror photon experiment, but with additional directors that maintained fixed settings. But Aspect placed quartz crystals between these directors and the particles, which would deflect the entangled photons randomly to one director or the other, independent of the experimenters. Aspect made thousands of measurements, and Einstein was proven wrong again. Boleyn's calculations were confirmed a second time, but one gap remained unresolved. In the late 90s, Austrian physicist Anton Zellinger recreated the same setup that Alan Aspect had established, but he added ultrafast, random number generators that controlled the transparency of quartz crystals. This meant that if hidden Einstein parameters were somehow trapped inside the particles and affecting the experiment, Zellinger had completely eliminated that possibility. And guess what? His calculations still held. Based on all these experiments, Clauser, Aspect, and Zillinger won the 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics. This means that the entire scientific community agrees that quantum processes are fundamentally ignorant and that they only acquire certain parameters when we force them to do so through observation. So, if you suddenly acquired quantum properties, you wouldn't really know who you were. You would exist in a superposition of all your possible forms and destinies until someone else observed you and collapsed the superposition into a single state. But one of the fundamental questions of quantum physics remains unanswered. What is it that collapses superpositions and eventually gives rise to our boring, defined macro world? Who or what is the observer that causes the universe to appear? It seems that the observer could be the scientist checking whether Schrodinger's cat is alive, the mindless particle director of the experiment, or even another quantum particle that observes through its interactions. But the wildest theory I've heard is that the black holes scattered throughout the universe could actually be the observers that help determine the properties of the universe on the largest scales. They absorb light, just like the human eye, and thus monitor everything around it. So, if black holes didn't exist, we could really have quantum properties. So would you like to exist in a superposition and radically change your life after it collapses? Please tell us in the comments at what point in the video you were completely confused or managed to follow and understand. That's all for today. See you next time. Goodbye.